and welcome to another Looney Tunes review video. If you are new to the channel, make sure you subscribe to follow my journey to review all 1000 classic Looney Tunes shorts and give this video a like as well. So this is a review for I've Got to Sing a Torch Song, released in 1933. It's the 67th in the series and it's directed by the legendary Tom Palmer. I kid, of course, he's not a good director at all, but anyway, I have to say that. Now, you can find this on the Looney Tunes Gone Collection Volume 5 DVD set. A HD version was put on the Gold Diggers of 1933 Blu-ray, and it makes total sense, as you will hear later on as to why. In case you haven't seen this cartoon, well, it's just people listening to the radio, and we get all sorts of celebrity caricatures, and there's really not much to it. It's a pretty bad one. <laughs> Thankfully, not as bad as Buddy's Day Out, but yeah, yeesh. <laughs> It's not, not that good. Normally, I would put in a re-edit of the original audio commentary, but I didn't really have that much to say back then, and I did put a lot of the celebrity cameos in terms of who they are, so people can actually identify them. And, yeah, I wasn't happy with that result. I mean, not all of the commentaries were ever going to be winners, but I figured this is my way of making it right. So, let's jump into the actual cartoon itself. So, here's some of the trivia. Now, this is the second and final short to be directed by, as I mentioned, the legendary Tom Palmer, although it's legendary probably perhaps for the wrong reasons. He was fired for the poor quality of Buddy's Day Out and this particular short. And it's also rumored that this short as well was reworked by Fritz Freeling, but I can't find any substantial evidence of that. I could find some that he reworked Buddy's Day Out along with some other Buddy short. I think there was like two being made, but here, Regardless, yeah, you can clearly see why he got fired. And I actually mentioned in the original audio commentary that I enjoyed this one, but I should have elaborated. I enjoyed it because of how bad it was. So, you know. But this one is filled with all sorts of you know, celebrity trivia and a few other bits and pieces. Let's start off with the celebrities. Who do we see in this particular short? And I will go through the ones that are perhaps not musically, um, mu uh, music focused. And my good friend Manny Cruz, the Tuny Tenor, who will be talking about the music in this, he's going to go into that. So, who do we see? We see George Bernard Shaw. He was an activist and he was a playwright. And yeah, he was. Considered controversial because at one point he mentioned he admired the Soviet Union in the 20s. And if you know your history, well, there was a lot of starvation and the, yeah, it, it, it was pretty bad. You know, was, I mean, at one point Stalin was, yeah, an ally in World War II. But in the 20s, though, he was basically, well, a murderer, really. So, and why is he battling the globe? Well, that could just be a symbolism for it. I mean, it's so poorly done, but that's probably what it means. But if you have any more, uh, more information about that, definitely let me know. But that's how I feel that um, this was referencing. We've got Joan Blondell, and I probably butchered her name. I, <laughs> I've never actually heard it said. Maybe I should watch one of the trailers, but you'll see James Cagney. Now, they were both movie stars, and they were in Footlight Parade together. And there was a really weird gag in, in that appears to be a reference to Cagney's role in The Public Enemy, where he would have the, put the grapefruit on someone's face. And if you haven't seen the movie, definitely check it out. The Public Enemy is a really, really good film. And that was his breakout role. But wow, if that's the case, then this is definitely poorly done. We've got Ben Burney. I will point out that I like the gag with the record player. I mean, it was predictable. And you, know, you knew that something like that was going to happen, but yeah, a little chuckle. Why not? Manny will go through some details regarding Ben. We have Benito Mussolini. And if you're not aware of World War II history, you, should, you would obviously know that he's part of the Axis powers along with Germany and Japan. At this point in time, he was basically known as an Italian fascist dictator. And at this point was, you know, more known for being behind Italy as a totalitarian state with a foreign policy that would have invaded certain areas of Africa to sort of spread the whole fascist idea. And later on, he would have Italy leave the League of Nations and that sort of thing. And that's where the saying is, came from. It's like, well, at least he makes the trains run on time. So, yeah. Now, there's a comedy duo that is mostly forgotten today, and that's, of course, Robert Woosley and Ben Wheeler, known as Wheeler and Woolsley. And I'm guessing the reason they're mostly forgotten is that Robert Woosley would pass away in 1937, 
but they were very, very popular in the 30s. And it's a shame that they're not quite as well known today because the stuff is actually pretty good. You can definitely have a look at some of the stuff. In fact, um, there are a few of the movies uh, via Warner Archive as well. This particular scene regarding the pot, that may be referencing to their movie from 1933, So This Is Africa. I mean, I'm guessing, I mean, again, the cartoon is so poorly made. I'm thinking some of these references might be accidental or just intentional, but just poorly done. We get three ladies at the end. First up, we have Greta Garbo. She was an actress who successfully went from silence to talkies. And when she went to talkies, there was like a big deal about it with the whole Garbo talks. And that was for her first talkie, Anna Christie, which was in 1930. Later on, she'd be perhaps more well-known for being one of the most notoriously private celebrities and refusing all publicity, vast majority of interviews and such, and there'll be the whole thing about Garbo sighting, where she would go for walks and people try and spot her and that kind of thing. We have Zazu Pitts, and much like Greta, she started in silence, more notably in comedies. She did try her hand in dramatic acting, but... It didn't quite work out, and she basically stayed in comedies. She would successfully go into talkies, and she would also find a lot of work in radio, and she worked well past when Greta Garbo actually had retired. Mae West should be familiar to a lot of you if you're following the channel, because she was already referenced in a Bosco short, a Buddy short, and now a Merry Melody short, and if you haven't watched those reviews, well, she was a successful American actress, and she was basically a major sex symbol. I mean, you know, certain things like to be perhaps exaggerated in these shorts, if you get my meaning. We have Ed Wynn, and we have this running gag. Now, I mean, first of all, he's wearing the fire helmet. That's referring to his radio show, The Fire Chief, where all sorts of weird, weird and wonderful things would happen. But then at the end, when you have the final gag, there was just not, nothing to it. Just why? I think it was just a comment on how silly his show actually was, but I don't get it. It's it's not good. We have Bing Crosby, or sorry, Cros Bingby. <laughs> it's some ridiculous name. My good friend Manny will go through that, but I will mention that he, by this point, was a very successful solo act. There is one particular reference here. I believe that's Leopold Stokowski. I could be wrong. Again, because these caricatures are so poorly done, I don't know, this could be referring to another another composer. So if you think it's Sikowski or not, definitely let me know, because I definitely want to have these things correct. And wow, there's even more references to this really poor, poor short. So we have Mike and Ike. Now, for this short, it appears to be a reference to either the comic, which was Mike and Ike. They look alike. Hey, that rhymes. Hmm, that's my Simpsons reference there. Or it could just be possibly due to it being the lingo at the time for salt and pepper shakers. Take your pick. It could be either. It's definitely not the US candy Mike and Ike, because that did not exist until 1940. So at least we know what it's not. And we got Topsy and Eva. Definitely know that that's a reference to the main to the two main female characters of the same name from Uncle Tom's Cabin. Another reference I'm not sure on is the in, in regards to the dental campaign where he spits out the teeth. I'm, I don't get it. I'm assuming that there was some kind of an ad jingle relating to, you know, you go brush your teeth and all that. I looked it up and I'm trying to find something, but there must've been some sort of a specific radio campaign regarding getting people to brush their teeth and look after their gums. I did see a lot about the gums around this time. So people can obviously not you know lose their teeth and have dentures. Which makes sense, right? <laughs> and yeah, we get the a scene that which references Amos and Andy, and that was a very popular radio show at the time about two black characters. Yeah, as you'd expect, they were voiced by white people at the time. I mean, did you really expect any different? Of course you did. I mean, gag wise, <laughs> it's, this is mostly funny of how bad things really are. I mean, you get the cheap joke of the woman in the girdle. I mean, it's kind of funny. I get what they're trying to do, but eh, okay, whatever. The whale joke is pretty dumb. Like, I chuckled at it because of its whole ineptitude. And yeah, when I see a lot of roadworks not seemingly get completed, I figure that that's what they're doing. They're just playing a game. They're just hiding. 
Then again, you can replace that pretty much with uh, mobile phones or as you guys in America say, cell phones. That's probably what actually happens. And the piece de resistance in terms of just outright stupidity, that whole sequence with the three ladies. Never mind the fact that the caricatures are poorly drawn, never mind the fact that the voices aren't particularly good. Why? <laughs> That's my big question for those three ladies singing together. Like, why do they put these three ladies just singing along this, you know, admittedly good song, but they're playing all these instruments all of a sudden? I don't know. There was, I guess, a point of the gag that just completely didn't come through at all. And. Every cartoon needs to have at this point some sort of a Jimmy Durante reference, right? And of course, there's the Statue of Liberty singing because she, or he, so you actually hear a guy's voice coming for the Statue of Liberty. I've got to sing a torch song. <laughs> now, you're probably wondering what the point of this whole short actually is. I mean, I guess it's just a play on the fact that radio was actually even more popular than movies were. You know, you think of it as what's happening today with cinema, how a lot of people are now opting, instead of spending all the money to go into the cinema, they'd rather stay home and stream a lot of TV, you know, Netflix and such. Similar deal here, they'll go to movies and, and all that, but if they're at home and they just don't want to spend their money, I mean, remember, this is part of the Great Depression, you know, a lot of people are saving money too, they just turn on the radio, they'd exercise, you know, with some of the exercise programs, cooking programs, they'd learn, they'd laugh at the comedy programs and be entertained by all the wonderful action adventures, you know, the Lone Ranger and that sort of thing. But yeah, it's just poorly done. So rather than me go on and on and on about how poorly done this is, because I'm sure you guys all get the idea, my good friend Manny Cruz, the Toonie Tenor, he's going to go through the music and just a couple of the other references because they're more musically related. So Take it away, Manny. Hi, everyone. This is Manny Cruz, the Toonie Tenor, coming at you with another edition of It's Time for Manny's Music Time with music trivia for you today. For the 1933 Mary Melody cartoon, I've got to sing a torch song directed by Tom Palmer. I don't want to get into too much of the specifics of the cartoon itself in terms of the, what happens in the cartoon because this was a rough one. I, I forgot how bad this cartoon is, but despite it being bad in terms of plot pacing and animation oh it was oof. palmer did not have a good run at warner brothers and obviously with this cartoon and buddy's day out it's yeah i can see why he didn't last long but there is a lot to gleam from in terms of music as well as some historical significance so for starters when it comes to the music this is the first merry melody cartoon under the full schlesinger unit so as you know your history you're aware of Harmon and Ising parted ways with leon schlesinger in 1933 and they eventually started working with mgm and started their studio schlesinger had to scramble he created his own production studio uh, leon schlesinger productions which lasted until him selling it in 1944 to warner brothers proper but he had to scramble he had to assemble artists from all over the country he had to take some people away from the harmonizing studio and he got the efforts of bernard brown and norman spencer to be the musical directors for this cartoon and throughout the early schlesinger years before carl Stalling arrived, Bernard Brown and Norman Spencer would trade off doing the musical scores. Norman Spencer was the music director himself, and from what I remember off the top of my head, his son was actually his orchestrator, or his arranger, and Bernard Brown was the sound editor for the cartoon, so he preceded Treg Brown when it comes to the sound. But they would trade off in music responsibility, and in one case, in a later cartoon in the next year, 1934, Bernard Brown actually stepped up to the director's position, which is pretty interesting. So, as for the cartoon itself, just a few things I wanted to point out. I want to thank the efforts of Keith Scott in his book about cartoon voices. You will see at the end of the cartoon that there's caricatures, very badly drawn caricatures of Greta Garbo, Mae West, and Zazu Pitt singing the title song. And that was done by Noreen Gamil. That was a woman who did the voice for those characters. And also the Rhythmettes uh, provided the trio that was singing at the piano. And people that were singing at the piano, it's always interesting because when I saw that scene again, I was like, ah, that's the end animation that sticks in my mind from Speaking of the Weather from Frank Tash on 1937, where they sing the title song of that cartoon in that one. So that was some reused animation in the later one. So let's jump into the music itself, because again, 
I'll let Anthony deal with all the caricatures and all that other stuff. According to the cue sheets, thank you again to the efforts of Daniel Goldmark for compiling these. So this is the first Warner Brothers cartoon that used the song, I Think You're Ducky, as the Merry Melodies theme song. And that would be used until 1936 when it was replaced with the ubiquitous Barely We Roll Along. I do like I, I Think You're Ducky. I think it's interesting in the very early Mary Melodies from the Schlesinger unit, you have a repeat of the main theme. And then it loops again and then it finishes off. Whereas later on, the theme song will get shortened by a few seconds. So the cartoon itself starts off with a montage of different characters, some caricatures. And you see all these different people listening to the radio and exercising. It's kind of interesting. You know, well, A, I did some exercising earlier today or rather yesterday because I'm recording this at two o'clock in the morning. Yay. But yesterday I was uh, training with my friend working out through Zoom because he lives in California and I live in New Jersey. But it's kind of like I was thinking about that while I was watching the beginning of this cartoon where people were doing their exercise routines while listening to the radio, which which was, you know, obviously how people listened to music and entertainment back in those times. So in the beginning montage, you hear little bits and pieces of little Annie Rooney. One, two, breathe deeply. One, two, one, two, breathe deeply. One, two, one, two, breathe deeply. One, two, one, two. You hear a tidbit of the title track, I've Got to Sing a Torque Song, which I'll talk a little bit more in a bit. You hear a little bit of Turkey in the Straw, The Stars and Stripes Forever from John Philip Sousa. You hear the Shadow Waltz, which is kind of related to the title track, and I'll get to in a bit. And you hear Petting in the Park, which is the name of a Merry Melody cartoon that I'll talk about down the road. And then you hear Rule Britannica when you had George Bernard Shaw, the elderly British man. So, yeah, he's British. We got to put that on. So let's talk about the title track itself. So title track itself was written by Harry Warren and Al Dubin. I've spoken about it a million times. I'm going to speak about them another million times throughout these commentaries. And they also wrote The Shadow Waltz. I've Got to Sing a Torque Song comes from the 1933 musical film Gold Diggers of 1933. The Shadow Waltz, which is featured in the montage with the radio, is also from the same film. And the title song and The Shadow Waltz were originally sung by actor Dick Powell. The title song was uh, later covered by such artists as Bing Crosby and Rudy Valley. So... Bing Crosby or Crosbingsby sang the song in the bathtub called Why Can't This Night Go On Forever? The song itself was composed by a songwriter by the name of Isham Jones. And the information that I'm about to read to you comes from this website called the Syncopated Times, the Red Hot Jazz Archive. So a history of jazz before 1930. So Isham Jones, he was born January 31st, 1894, and he died October 19th, 1956, was one of the biggest dance band conductors and songwriters of the 20s. And he wrote several famous songs, including I'll See You in My Dreams, The One I Love Belongs to Someone Else. But interestingly, one of the songs that I noticed that Isham Jones did compose that is very prominent in Warner Brothers history is It Had to Be You. It had to be you. It had to be you. And what's uh, I'm thinking, of course, a book review. It had to be you. So the part of book review where it has the very sickly looking Frank Sinatra caricature singing to the wolf and he goes, Frankie. It had to be you. And there are other cartoons that feature It Had to Be You, but I just can't think of them off the top of my head. Of course, I should have done this, but I did not. A little bit more about Isham Jones. I am all over the place tonight. He was born in Colton, Ohio, but he grew up in Saginaw, Michigan. Saginaw, Michigan, for me, I'm thinking of Stevie Wonder, one of my heroes. He was born in Saginaw, Michigan in 1950. He worked in a coal mine leading blind mules. And then his father got his musical talent from his father. His father played a fiddle. And he also led a band at a small Methodist church. Oh, sorry. Isham. His name is pronounced Isham. My bad. And Isham moved to Chicago in 1915. 
and he continued composing during the World War One period. He collaborated with different lyricists throughout the years. And like I said, his orchestra was really popular around 20s and 30s. He did serve in the military during World War One. He was a sax player. Yay. I used to play the saxophone. And probably down the road, I could elaborate a little bit more on his stuff because I don't want this commentary to be any longer than it is. So going back to the cue sheets, you have Heading for a Wedding. So there's the part where you have the very badly drawn Ben Burney character. Ben Burney was a very famous uh, band leader and radio host at the time. Greetings and salutations, you guys and gals. Here's the old maestro and all the lads. Yowza, so help me. That's my terrible impression. Ben Burney. Of course, I'm always thinking of uh, Ben Birdie, caricature of him from the 1936 Merry Melody from Fritz Freeling, The Cuckoo Nut Grove. And I always, I don't know, I always got a kick out of that cartoon. Greetings and salutations, you guys and gals. This is the old maestro and all the lads bringing you a program of dance music from the Coconut Grove, Yowza. Yowza, so help me. But in this cartoon, Ben Burney, he starts leading off. You think that he's counting off his band. Turns out to be he's conducting to a record, and that's where you hear Heading for a Wedding. Heading for a Wedding, I spoke a little bit about, if you listen to the commentary for We're in the Money, I go a little bit more into that. One, two. <laughs> You also hear a little bit of Ach du lieber Augustine in this cartoon, so on and so forth. Going back to the end of the cartoon, when you have uh, Zazu Pitts, Greta Garbo, and Mae West singing the title song, what's very, that whole sequence just weird on so many different levels, just the way it's drawn, pacing, just, yeah. But at the very end, they start playing like, I think Mae West is playing a bass drum, and I forgot who's playing a flute, but they start playing, and of course, I always think of that as the the melody that Bugs Bunny plays on the fife in the beginning of any Bonds today. But I actually didn't know the name of the song because I was too lazy to look it up before. But it is called The Girl I Left Behind, which is an English folk song that is from several hundred years ago. And it's usually associated when soldiers would go to war, usually on a naval ship or things of that nature. So that's why it made sense Bugs Bunny playing it in the beginning of any Bonds today. This commentary was a little bit, still a little bit longer than I anticipated because I also lost my place and I was rambling and it's two o'clock in the morning and I need to go to sleep and I've been doing plenty of research because I am a team player. So those are my thoughts for the 1933 Merry Melody. I've got to sing a torque song. I actually gleamed a little bit more information out of this cartoon than I anticipated. Again, I could have gone into even more details with the caricatures of the celebrities, but I figured Anthony is going to be doing the heavy lifting for that part. So I didn't want to be redundant. But yeah, I was looking again at the excellent Likely Looney, Mostly Mary blog that was done by Stephen Hartley. Excellent, excellent work he did. Sadly, he's no longer updating the blog but he was doing everything from beginning up until 1944 but he i was reading his his review about this cartoon and thrashing it appropriately i believe it was one of the comments that were saying yeah this cartoon is terrible and then you know someone's like this cartoon sucks why was it included on the six um, looney tunes golden collection it's like well you got to start somewhere and this was the very beginning of the schlesinger era as his own proper studio and you see this and you see buddy's day out and just how terrible Tom Palmer did during his very brief time as a director and obviously you had to start somewhere and then a few years down the road Tex Avery and and Fritz Freeling and Bob Clamp and Frank Tashlin started really spinning the wheels and making the Looney Tunes and Merry Melodies the masterpieces that they are now but hey Rome wasn't built in a day again those are my thoughts I hope you enjoy have a wonderful day remember this is Manny Cruz Tooney Tenor please feel free to follow me on social media at the Tooney Tenor T-O-O-N-E-Y Tenor T-E-N-O-R and this is appropriate for me to say this because this is the first time a Mary Melody would say this particular phrase, but that's all folks. I guess that's supposed to sound like Greta Garbo, but yeah, it's the first time that's all folks is said in the Mary Melody. La di da. Have a lovely night. That's all folks. Is this sure better than Buddy's Day Out? Yes. And that's probably one of the major credits I can give for it. It's at least a little bit funny and you can at least see what they were trying to do. But ultimately, this is a very poorly done short. But as Bob Clampett himself mentioned, because he was there at the studio around this time, everyone was green. Everyone was starting at the very beginning. And, you know, if you're going to get all these writers and artists and put them all together and expect great things, it's 
chances are it's not going to happen. You know, the greatest successes of when it comes to pop culture almost always come by um, by accident, and that's usually from various different elements just happening to come together at the one moment, and you know, and history changes. You know, Bugs Bunny has a really weird and convoluted history, which ended up with, of course, the wild hair, and then history was changed. But here, the expectation appears to be, we're going to poach all these wonderful writers and artists, and we're going to straight away make some of the greatest cartoons ever to compete with everyone else, because Bosco from the Harmonizing Studio was really, really popular. So the expectation was, hey, let's put everyone together like this, and we're going to make something really happen. And nope, it didn't happen. And it won't happen for a few years until Porky Pig arrives. This short gets a 2 out of 10 for me. It's so bad, and really the only place you can go from this short, and of course, by Day day out, is of course up. So that'll do it for this one. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, take care.